This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. So it's a pleasure today uh, to chat with Joni Kipnis. He's professor of immunology, pathology, neuroscience, neurology, I'm probably missing something. And he's also the, um, the director of the, um, what is it? It's a, a center brain, for- Brain Immunology and Glia. Brain Immunology and Glia, big, at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, before we start talking about your fascinating discoveries concerning interactions between the immune system and the brain and central nervous system, spinal cord as well, could you just go back to where you grew up in, in the country of Georgia and what kind of led you to an interest in first in immunology and then neuroscience? Yes, I grew up in uh, Soviet Georgia being uh, even then uh, a son and grandson of immigrants. So my family is from Ukraine and Russia and- uh, Oh no, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, some part of East, East, Eastern Europe. And then, uh, so they came to Georgia during the war and then uh, after the war, during the war, after the war. Uh, so I grew up, I was born there, I grew up there. And then in 19, 1990, it was not, uh, no, I mean, uh, well, it's one million, one million uh, Soviet Jews left Soviet Union. So we were just um, with them. So we immigrated to Israel. So all my high school and my, all my undergraduate training, graduate training was all done in, in Israel at the Weizmann Institute. Well, the graduate was Weizmann, undergraduate was Tel Aviv University. And uh, and so you have relatives that are being affected by this ongoing war then? Well, I think uh, we don't have right now anybody that I'm aware of in Ukraine, okay. but, but we have family in Russia, which, you know, of course, Russian people are affected as well. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and yes, and people in Georgia are very uh, nervous and watching this very, very carefully. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So then in Israel, uh, first you were at, at Tel Aviv, right, for your undergraduate, and then... PhD and you stayed on for a postdoc at the Weizmann, is that Yes, right? master's, well, it was a, a direct PhD, so I got my master's degree and my PhD and I stayed for a very short postdoc there, yeah. I all in the same lab, yeah, it was, it was just too, too, good to, too good to leave. Yeah, so go ahead and talk about your early discovery on, on in Michal Schwartz's lab there in, at the Weizmann. Yes, so, you know, we, it, so when I came to Michal's lab, we were, um, Actually, I came there in the uh, end of 1998, and uh, it just, when her paper just got accepted uh, to Nature Medicine, showing that autoimmune T cells could be neuroprotective. So basically cell, cells that are reactive against our own body, which we believe are driving autoimmune diseases, she showed that they actually can protect injured uh, spinal cords and injured uh, uh, maybe pieces of uh, uh, areas in the brain. And this was, uh, I mean, to me then was, I was very naive. I was fascinated by discovery, but to people who were already in science, this sounded like complete heresy because it was against anybody's um, understanding. Everybody was going after uh, suppressing the immune cells after uh, um, after, CNA, after a central nervous system injury. And she was actually above uh, talking about boosting them. So I remember I was working on something different. And then as my control group, I used this self-reactive cells just as a control group in my experiment to compare how these cells, these cells would work against cells I was interested in. And then obviously the control group came positive and there was, there was a higher survival. And I remember she was so excited about the control group way more than about my experiment. <laughs> and I, back then, you know, I couldn't understand why you're so excited about it. It's already been published. Of course, now I, I realize how important it is once the new student reproduces your published data, especially it's something that is, you know, maybe contented by, uh, uh, by others. Um, so um, I actually was, I, I became interested in understanding the role of regulatory T cells because we have, so for uh, every autoimmune cell, we also have a suppressor cell, which is there, or we call them regulatory cells. And they are there to modulate the immune response and so the idea was to see how these regulatory cells or these modulators of the immune system what role they are playing in uh, in recovery from injuries and so that was was more was my initial line of, of, of research and we showed their role and uh, how you can maybe augment the cells and suppress the cells and how you change survival after injury 
But then, you know, then I was thinking to myself and I said, okay, we're showing all these T cells are doing all these immune cells, lymphocytes are doing all these good things, but after injured, uh, injured brain or injured spinal cord injury, but what's the evolutionarily uh, meaning to it? I mean, why would evolution want to put a mechanism which would protect injured brain? I mean, who cares about individual with injured brain in evolutionary terms, right? Yeah. And I said, well, these cells must be doing something there which is not protection from injury. They must be doing something with the day-to-day maintenance. Ah. And I said, well, maybe, maybe stress. And so we actually collaborated with, 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 the, with the scientists back then in Beersheba University, in Ben-Gurion University, Beersheba in the south of Israel. And she actually was, was, was helping us with these behavior studies. And then we, we were looking how presence or absence of these immune cells affects mouse ability to do with stress. And so she had this beautiful model where she would expose mouse to a, a cat um, litter. And so mice will get stress. And then about, uh, I don't know, at 20% of mice will actually develop long-term uh, stress responses, hmm. which was a model for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Hmm. And so we showed that if the mouse doesn't have functional T cell, then you, the numbers of mice that develop this PTSD would be much higher suggesting that really immune cells are doing something for maintenance of the brain. And then I said, okay, if we are going that far, maybe they are also involved with learning and memory because what, what kind of learning is that if, without a stress, right? I think you can't really learn something without really a, a, a stress. And people say, well, you can learn cooking. I said, yeah, try it once. Try once to cook with a new recipe. It's extremely stressful. I love to cook, so I, I, I know how it goes. So everything is, everything, every learning is, is it involved stress. And so we thought, you know, maybe without functional immune system, mice won't be able to learn. Actually, it was quite interesting because we had back then, I remember very, very clearly, um, uh, uh, Alfred Zinger, uh, who is still an active science researcher at the NIH, he or she was visiting us. Uh, and he is a very famous in T-cell development. And so I shared with him this idea and he told me, I like, I like T-cells, but I, I, I think I don't like them that much. I mean, it's like it was <laughs> pushing you know, that T-cells would be involved in learning and memory. And uh, but, funny enough, but, he actually, well, go but, ahead, sorry. So, Johnny, so, so typically, I think most people who don't have a really in-depth knowledge of immunology, they think of these lymphocytes, T lymphocytes and B flat lymphocytes, they're circulating in the blood, right? And then um, if there's a pathogen, like a virus or a bacteria, they're involved in, in detecting and then getting rid of it. But these cells are, are circulating all the time. And so the idea, not only that, you know, and I know you're going to talk about this, they're not only circulating, but some of them are not circulating, really. They're just like staying right up in just outside the brain. Um, so uh, I just want to point that out as kind of background. These cells, ultimately, they come from the bone marrow, right? Yeah, I can, I can give it a little bit more immuno, immunology 101, okay. uh, immunology for neuroscientists. Um, okay. So yes, so we have, uh, if I do it very sim simple way, our immune system divided into two portions, uh, the innate and the adaptive. And the innate cells are cells that are, uh, if we're talking about pathogens, uh, these cells are eating uh, and they're killing usually pathogens without really caring whether this is a flu or a COVID. They would just go after it without really a, a much difference what type of pathogen that is. And then we have the adaptive. Those are the T cells and the B cells. And so the, those are all about specificity. And those are also all about memory, right? So now we have immune cells that have memory. That's why it's so important to vaccinate against COVID because what you create, all you create is you create a memory yeah. for a pathogen. So when it comes back again, immune system just extremely efficient because it remembers the pathogen. And you cannot, your innate cells are not sufficient to fight with pathogens. They need the help of adaptive immunity. So these are like the soldiers and these are more like generals. They tell you, they tell the immune system how to do. So on this adaptive part, on the part that thinks and recognizes, we have two types of cells. We have the T cells and we have the B cells. And so B cells making the antibodies, very important cells, right? So that's why we get vaccines. So we have memory B cells and then they just produce a bunch of antibodies. And they are so efficient. So they can neutralize the virus. They can tag the virus for destruction. They can do whatever. And then the T lymphocytes, so B cells and then T cells, we have two different types of flavors of T cells. Some are the killer cells. They're going after 
after the pathogen. Again, they're recognized and then they kill. And then the other cells are more of a really, the, I would say the generals of the, of the immune response. They really control the entire thing. We call them the helper cells. Um, so again, this is, this is extremely a simplistic uh, point. This is extremely simplistic and expl explanation of the immune system, but I think it gives you some, some idea. And you know, funny enough, I think that many neuroscientists actually now, thanks to COVID, uh, do know a little bit more about the immune system because everybody's on Twitter and everybody, of course, has an opinion and everybody knows a little bit about B cells and T cells, et cetera. So I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time to kind of um, talk about your immune node. Right, so then you go from infectious agents to tissue injury, you know, and, and th this general idea that the immune, immune response in tissue into actually a wound, say, you know, initially the thinking was it's all bad and you want to suppress the inflammation. And then there were some findings that this immune system activation actually is important for wound healing. Right. And then you extended this to the nervous system, not only with regards to uh, injury, like a traumatic injury or perhaps a, a stroke even. And now you're saying not only that, but the immune system, when there's no injury, plays an important role in, in um, modulating neuronal activity, stress response. Yes. So, you know, we all think of immune system, uh, 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 first of all, as our defense system against pathogens, which is, of course, that's the, that's the key role. It's like an army, right? So when we have invasion, army responds and protects the body. But army also, when there is no invasion, army also has a lot of function within the country, right? So if there is an earthquake, so invasion, but, but usually you, you, you ship your troops to help the civilians, right? And so same thing happens with the immune system. It plays a major role, for example, in cancer, right? In rejecting cancers. And actually 25, 30 years ago, this was heresy. Um, nobody wanted to hear that actually one of the key, key, key scientists who actually started this cancer immunotherapy is Robert Schreiber, who is a colleague here at WSU. I mean, it was no, no, nobody wanted to believe that this is you can really boost the immune system to, to, to kill cancers. But yes, so immune system is there. If you actually remove immune, cells, immune system from the mouse, they will develop many more cancers as the mouse ages. So uh, so, the, so the tumor part, and also, of course, the injury, you always have immune response. And yes, when you've cut your finger, it hurts uh, because you, you have this inflammation, right? So for, for days, it depends, of course, on the cut. And then what really is bothering you is this immune response and the inflammatory response. But if you remove it, she's been shown, like you mentioned, if you remove that immune response from the finger cut, your tissue will degenerate much faster and much, the outcome will be much worse. So you, yes, it hurts, but it's there to protect. And of course, you know, with the brain, it's a very similar response. You do CNS injury, central nervous system injury, the immune system rushes in and tries to protect. Does it always succeed? Well, probably no, because I also think, as I mentioned before, I, I guess within uh, during the evolution, there was no so much pressure to make this uh, immune response to, uh, against brain injuries as a very efficient uh, um, uh, process. And so I think it reacts, but then of course, you know, of course there's a, there's a skull. Uh, so of course there is a pressure buildup and then you, you create probably much more damage than, than, than benefit from the endogenous response. But the question is now, can you modulate it? And, and can you play with the immune system and make it, make it more efficient? And one of the fir first things the immune system does with an injury is to remove dead and, and dying cells. So, you know, kind of clean out the area and then, in a sense, prepare it for healing. Exactly. Yes, because as you, as of course, uh, you know, but I'm not, I'm not sure if all the listeners know that, uh, of course, um, uh, the uh, fat that covers the neurons in the in the brain and the spinal cord, called the myelin, is uh, quite growth inhibitory, and so you don't want this debris of myelin to just 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 flow around. So you really want to bring immune cells to eat those, and so these pigments are actually coming and eating them. Yeah. We have endogenous. We have cells that are that whose role is to kind of protect the brain and eat the eat the junk in the brain. Those called the microglia. 
or brain as in macrophages, but they're just not very efficient, you know, because again, they never they never learned to deal with uh, with injuries. And so when you have an injury to the brain or to spinal cord, that's a whole new world uh, for the brain tissue to, to to react to. So you need you need help from the periphery. So cells are coming and, you know, and trying to do their best. They're not succeeding, but doesn't mean that you want to completely eliminate this response. I think if you eliminate, your outcome is much worse. Yeah. And there was, uh, I'm going to have Beth Stevens, who uh, she discovered that the microglia can actually, first she studied this during brain development, can actually remove unwanted or unneeded synapses, individual synapses. So that's another sort of normal function in the absence of any injury or infection uh, of yes. these cells. And I think microglia are doing this exceptionally well during development. And I mean, also, I mean, microglia love synapses, right? Probably the very, very fa fa favorite food, but they are not as good in removal of, uh, of this effect from the I neurons, see. the myelin. And I so see. they are not very efficient in those, in, in, in tagostosis of that. So then you need to bring some more, more uh, hardcore hardcore workers, and those are the peripheral monocytes. But again, you know, when you, when you bring uh, troops to clean up the earthquake site, uh, would, could they create some uh, collateral damage by clearing that site and you know, removing debris to a maybe clean site? Uh, yes, they can. So overall net is the benefit, but it temporarily, you know, they're closing the roads, they're interfering with residents. I mean, there is a lot of problems. And I think the same thing is happening. Just, just the question is, how much can you tolerate? How much can you wait? And the brain being enclosed in a box, right? Mm -hmm. When you have too many people there, too many immune cells there, you just can't tolerate because there's a pressure build up. And so then you start, you, then you create, then the other problems are, are, are coming up. So I will never say that um, uh, immune system is always a fantastic for the brain, but I think that the initial, at least the initial intention is the goal there not to kill, but to protect. Yeah. Okay, now your, your work over the last decade or so has focused a lot on, on what's exactly going on in the, in the brain and the interactions of, you know, where are these immune cells? You know, how do they move around and so on? And you've, you've discovered this interesting uh, lymphatic system. Most of the viewers and listeners will have heard of lymph nodes. They may, for example, they may have a swollen lymph node if they get an infection and there's immune cells. Uh, it's kind of a reservoir of immune cells. So can you talk, and this gets a little complicated, all this is complicated, but talk a little bit about the different uh, immune brain inter, uh, interaction. Yeah, so maybe I'll just give a little bit of introduction about how immune system works. And uh, the example I like to give is, think of your neighbors going through a trash can on a daily basis for a couple of weeks, right? So they will know everything about you. They will know where you buy your food, what you wear, <laughs> what you eat. They will know everything, no secrets, right? Uh, and then you know, imagine that suddenly they will start seeing some weird, weird things appearing in your trash can. I don't know, this could be, I don't know, this could be COVID positive tests or whatever. So they will know something is wrong, right? Or they will see, I don't know, blood soaked towels if you want to go really badly. So they will know something is wrong, something is bad. So, you know, if they are attentive neighbors, they will either call police or will go and check what's happening in their household. So same things happen in the immune system. They receive basically all the junk, all the waste from the tissue is moving normally through this lymphatic, which are sewage pipes, through the lymphatic pipes into the centers, which are called the lymph nodes. And so their immune systems, immune cells are sitting and basically going through the tissue garbage. And they're saying, okay, I know what's this, I know what's this, I know what's this. Oh, wait a second, what is this? This is new, that wasn't there. Oh, that's not even from this tissue. This is from some, something new. Okay, maybe it's a tumor growing. So let's go and check what's happening there. Because of mutations, you have new, new proteins that are coming up. Or the cell will say, no, no, don't worry. This is, you know, this is a, this is, this is a, a typical flu pathogen. I know exactly what it is. So then they recruit those right troops that know how to fight uh, a flu pathogen and they're rushing to the tissue to actually take care of the, of the tissue, right? So that's, that's, that's all about uh, tissue immune communication. Every tissue drains into a particular lymph node and this is the headquarters of the immune system, okay? Or the trash collector site. Okay. The idea was the brain doesn't have such system. 
So basically, brain is immune privileged. We're going back to 1940s with Peter Medawar or even before him, uh, 1920s with Japanese scientist Shirai or Rockefeller scientist Sturm and uh, Murphy, uh, where the idea was that if, basically what they did is they took, they took uh, foreign cells. If you put them on a skin, they get rejected right away by the immune system, they're being attacked. You put them in the brain and they stay there for a very, very long time. And so the notion was, well, brain is immunologically unique. There is no access for the immune system to the brain. And then people said, well, the brain is immune privileged. And then the question is, what is, what is immune privilege? What does it mean? And then you ask 10 scientists and they give you 11 different answers, <laughs> right? Because you, again, you coin a term and then everybody understands that term as they wish or as they can or as they as, as 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 much literature as they read right so we all we all limited in our in our in our knowledge of course and our ability to understand it, 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 these yeah. things and so brain immune privilege can kind of translate it into there is never immune brain interaction but then i say so basically then this a very important maintenance crew of our body immune cells will should never see problems in the brain if there is a brain infection or the in the matter of fact, we know that if there is brain infection, there is a very strong immune response, which actually often kills the host because it's so strong and so severe. So of course, the problems in the brain are being seen by the immune system. And actually, if you read very carefully Medawar's works from 1940s, back then he already showed that if you put, for example, these foreign cells in the brain, yes, immune cells will not attack them very efficiently. But if you put the same foreign cells in the brain and in the periphery, and educate your immune cells against those foreign cells, then they will reject the, 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 the cells from both periphery and the brain. Huh. So immune cells can get into the brain. I mean, we have multiple sclerosis, which is a very, not very common, but among autoimmune diseases, it's quite substantial. One in a thousand people are developing, uh, is it one in a thousand, maybe I'm a mess? Maybe a bit less, maybe a bit uh, less than that, but it's still, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major, major autoimmune disease where immune cell is attacking the brain. So if the brain was this, you know, completely immune privilege, then the immune cells wouldn't be able to get there. So yes, they can. The question is what brings them there a problem. And so what we were trying to understand is what brings immune cells into the brain? What brings them out of the brain? How do they travel? And how could it be conceptually that the brain wouldn't communicate with the immune system? So we were not looking for any lymphatic vessels because I knew they don't exist. You don't look for something you know that doesn't exist. But then actually my, 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 my postdoc, re, so no, and the concept was, the notion was that the immune system, which are maybe in the brain or around the brain, they would go crawl out of the brain through this. So where our nose is attached to our heads, olfactory nerves are coming out to innervate the nose. And so the idea was, well, they just will crawl along the nerves and then that's how they will get into a lymph node. Well, maybe. So we were looking into this area. We just could never find enough immune cells there. But when we looked at the borders of the brain, the brain coverings or what's called meninges, we would find a huge amount of immune cells. So my student asked me, she said, how do the cells get out of there? Do they just die there? Or do they get out somehow? Because if you get out, you have at some point to hit lymphatic vessels, the sewage pipes, right? You cannot remove your, I mean, whatever is in your household, you eventually remove through your one of the sewage uh, uh, outlets, right? And, um, and so what, uh, a postdoc in the lab, Antoine Nouveau, he said, he said okay, let's maybe instead of looking at this, at this coverings of the brain by slices, when we see a very, very thin kind of covering of the brain, let's take the whole film of the, let's lift that film of the brain and mount it as a one, as a 2D tissue on a slide, right? So now the entire coverings of the brain was mounted on a slide. And then, and then we looked into this, this thing and we said, wait a second, what's happening? So it's a perfused mouse. So meaning that before we're killing, before we're euthanizing the mouse, we're removing all the blood from the blood vessels. So all the blood vessels should be empty yeah. of blood cells. Yeah. And suddenly we see those two vessels in the middle of, 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 the, of the brain coverings, which were full with immune cells. And we said, oh, there's no, I mean, we, we, we did perfusion. So the immune cells should have been washed out they would only not been washed out from a sewage system because it's not connected directly to the, to, to the pump, to the heart. Yeah. And we said, could this be a lymphatic system? But it can be because it's not there, right? We know it's not there. So then it's a, it a real story. We went to actually a colleague and we said, do you have any, anything to label these lymphatics with some antibody or something? And he gave us you know, the antibody to try it, which we labeled and we found those beautiful vessels 
a lot. So there is a major blood vessel in the in the top of our heads called the sinus. This is the one that drains all the blood from the brain before it goes out. And along this major, major blood vessel, there are two tiny, tiny vessels. And those were labeled with all the right markers for lymphatic epithelial cells. So they are really bona fide lymphatic vessels. And then we show that indeed, if you put whatever, whatever, uh, so what we do is we kind of mimic, mimic the uh, waste by putting some fluorescent material either in the brain or in the cerebrospinal fluid. And then we can see how it would be picked up by those tiny vessels and driven into uh, uh, centers, which are deep cervical lymph nodes in mice. And so now you have communication between the brain and the immune system. And now you can actually study these two systems, right? There is no need to go through some weird pathways. So because we know how cells get into lymphatics, we know how lymphatics are functioning, we know what drains them, we know the molecular handles on lymphatics and on the immune cell trafficking. So suddenly the questions of brain immune communications become more mechanistic and less descriptive, which I think is really fantastic. And as, so this lymphatic system is, is kind of, out here, right, and things drain into it. And then what about on the inside of the brain? You have the ventricles where there's cerebral spinal fluid in. Is there, are there any immune cells, like uh, on the, the um, say the lining of the ventricles? Yes, so um, the immune cells are sitting around, so we have in the brain coverings have S3, three layers. The pia matter, which is very attached to the skull, to the brain, the dura matter is attached to the skull, and then underneath dura we have arachnoid, and between the arachnoid and the pia, this is where cerebrospinal fluid flows. So there is immune cells in every layer of this of this of these brain coverings. And now the in the ventricles, you also well the ventricles also have choroid plexus, which actually produces cerebrospinal fluid, and there is lots of immune cells in there. But what we think is that. Of course, you, you, I don't know if you interviewed already Mike and Nidegaard, um, yeah. or if you, yeah, I'm sure you're planning on doing so. I mean, Mike and of course, she discovered the pathway that CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, takes to go through the brain. What, what basically she calls it the G-lymphatic glymphatic system, which she will explain why she called it so, even though there's no lymphatic vessels going through the brain, but the system, kind of system of channels almost, uh, that does the function. And the idea is that the CSF that goes around the brain also can go into the brain and wash the brain through. So whatever is in the brain now will be removed and taken out into the borders. And then from the borders out into lymphatics. Ah. Now, why is this so important? Because as I said, you don't want immune cells, normal tissue, normal tissue. Immune cells would come in and patrol the tissue. And lymphatics will be within the tissue. So every all these interactions will be happening right within the t every millimeter of the tissue will have the immune cells and the lymphatics and all the there. In the brain, instead of doing this, the material has to go all the way, which is a no, it's a long way, right? All the way from the brain out until it reaches uh, the vasculature. And then and the vascular channels that will be drained out into the borders of the brain depends where you are. I think you will probably drain just now kind of original well, the original drainage of the brain. And then in the borders of the brain, this, this kind of this waste will accumulate. And then from there, will go out into lymphatic vessels. And again, you don't want immune cells in the brain. So the example is, like, imagine you have a house and babies are sleeping in the house, and you, but you want to host a party. Now, how do you do it? You bring party people and you will, you will wake up your babies, which are the neurons, and the party people are the immune cells. So what you do is instead of bringing party folks into the house, you take all the food and you take it out into your backyard or front yard or courtyard or whatever you want. And so you host party outside. I think that's what the brain and the, and the spinal cord evolved to do. Instead of bringing these this cells inside, they take everything out. That's why the borders of the brain are so important because that's where neuroimmune interaction is happening. That's where patrolling of the tissue is happening. Now, if there is a problem that is detected in that level, Okay, then immune cells will invade the brain because then, then you know, babies are relevant. If there is a fire in the house, you know, you go in and you take those babies out and you do whatever you need to do. But as long as everything is fine, the patrolling of the tissue is happening in the borders. Okay, great. So now, why don't you expand a little on your work on the roles of, of the immune cells, particularly these T lymphocytes in normal 
functions of the brain. And then after that, we can move on to, I think what a lot of people will be really interested in your, your really exciting preclinical studies suggesting a potential for immunotherapies for a number of different major neurological disorders. So start with normal functions. You talked about stress responses, but you've also looked at other other Yes. Uh, aspects. So I'll ask a provocative question. How did your or our mine or anybody else's behavior change? How did it change from, let's say, April 2020 to April 2021 even, or May 2021? Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. So behavior, our behavior changed dramatically, right? Because there was a threat, there was a pathogen, and we were sitting in homes, we were, you know, wearing uh, three layers of masks, and we were not flying anywhere, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters, nothing. But the moment we got vaccines, we started to go out. We may be still wearing masks, but we're going out, we're going to restaurants, we're doing, we, we started to, and then now, of course, we have our three, three doses and so four doses for some people and everybody is, feels safer to go out and actually do some activity. So our behavior changed as a result of, the, of our immune system status, right? <laughs> it did, that's a correlation. Well, it's not a correlation, actually. I think that's a, 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 this is absolutely causation. You know that you are protected against the virus. So you oh. feel safer oh, to see. perform risky behavior. Yeah, yeah, Actually, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a complete causation. Yeah. Now let's think evolutionarily of behaviors, which are you know the most basic behaviors to maintain life, foraging, mating, parenting, social interactions. And you can name more. All of these, if you cannot protect yourself from the partner, you will uh, pathogens that partner is, is bearing, you will die. So I actually would argue that this, that the development or evolution of the immune system is what allowed all these complex behaviors to, to, to evolve as well. Okay, so and I know as a neuroscientist for you, it may be difficult to hear that. But if you're looking, if you're thinking evolutionarily, right, you wouldn't be able to evolve these behaviors without knowing that you're not gonna get killed by pathogens in the, in the, in the, in the other, in the, on, the, on the other end. So you I, have I've... to have, yeah, go ahead. I've thought a little bit about this evolutionary perspective. Now, if you go way back in evolution, uh, simple organisms had nervous systems, be certainly before they had this adaptive immune system. And there's for sure, yes, even you know one of the heavily studied um, invertebrates is a roundworm called C. elegans, and my understanding they don't. They don't have even macrophages, and they don't have adaptive. They do. They do. The macrophages. They do. I mean, that's how uh, that's how uh, Mechnikov discovered macrophages, right? He was pinning those worms, uh, and then he saw that the cells are attacking the pin, and so he came up with the idea that, well, wait a second, maybe there is some protect protecting cells in our bodies. I mean, that he got Nobel Prize for macrophages subsequently. Ilya Mechnikov. Okay. I thought they in were worms. Just, I don't know if it was C. elegans, but it was in worms. But 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 you know. But what I, I but it, so define macrophage. Uh, amoeba is a macrophage because it can eat, right? So if yeah. you can phagocytose, then then you know then mac macrophage means that you're eating something big. I mean that's and, what and macrophage. They, they means. move. They move. Yes, through exactly. Yeah, just yeah, like yeah. amoeba. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you can move and you can fag, or even if you cannot move, if you, if you can if you can eat, I mean that's but no, but. Um, and then, of course, all these organisms, they have, uh, they have antimicrobial peptides, which are a primitive molecules, yeah. Yeah. which are part of the immune system, right? So yeah. fly, flies, for example, they have, uh, I think, 50-some uh, or 60-some known uh, um, antimicrobial peptides, uh, which actually, if you remove some of them, there's, I think, four or five classes for antifungi, for, for, for bacteria, for viruses. I mean, those are, they're not adaptive, but they are, they are innate, but they, are, yeah. they have some specificity. So it's, it's, yeah. it's okay. quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, I don't know, but also the behaviors are much simpler, right? And so, I, by the way, I was told, and you know, I, we are, we're just starting our fly, fly expedition. So I don't know flies that well, but I was told that actually when flies hatch uh, and they become social, right? Uh, there is a, great induction of bunch of genes among which is a group of immune genes and nobody oh. can understand why why this is happening oh. so what we again what we think is again you need you need your immune system to protect you from pathogens coming from from another partner 
And if that's the case, if we agree on that, maybe we cannot, but, but, yeah, but, yeah. If, we, if, we, but if we can agree on that, then during evolution, now, now let's think about millions of years of evolution where the two systems were evolving together yeah, yeah. and we're depending on each other. Of course, the immune system also needs brain support. And I'm sure that the immune system is probably governed by the brain completely like any other system yeah. in our body. Yeah. So now, I don't know, you also have that many signaling pathways that probably, I mean, there's a limit, finite number of those, right, in our organisms. So both systems are probably borrowing them and using them. And then, of course, we discovered uh, cytokines first in immune cells, actually the very first one by Eagle Gary, IL-1, and he called it lymphodrec as a, as a shit produced by lymphocytes. But I mean, in, in the same way, this could have been discovered in the brain, and then it would be yeah. maybe called, you know, neurokine. Yeah. And then, and then, if you look now on the map, so we knew it for many, many years that, for example, all the almost every immune cell will have a receptor, which is you know, a molecule that recognizes the signal for almost every neurotransmitter. Anything we can think about, that's still calling dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, yeah. anything you can think about, there is a receptor on immune cells. Actually, some are also unique. Some would be shared with the brain. Others would be like unique class of these receptors, which would be primarily expressed on the immune cells. And then some other type will be expressed in the brain. So clearly they can understand each other language. And what we're showing recently, what we showed is that there are also receptors for immune molecules, for cytokines on neurons. Yeah. So why would neurons express receptors for molecules which are only produced by T cells? If there are never T cells in the brain, or there should be T cells in the brain in a healthy brain, right? So clearly, the system is yeah. poised to interact with each other. So yeah. I don't think the question is should be any longer do the two systems interact. No. Let's just try to understand how they interact. Yeah. And I can tell you that if you take a mouse and you remove, well, no, I shouldn't say any part of the immune system, but if you remove at least, I can tell you for sure about T cells. If you remove T cells from a normal, healthy mouse many of the behavioral tasks will be affected. You know, it may be direct effect. And in some cases we showed, we're able to show the really uh, direct effect from the molecule to neurons and all this. In other cases, it may be indirect effect. But the fact that it's happening, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we just were publishing it, I was very, I was very worried. I said, you know, what if, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fluke and maybe we just know it will be only reproduced in our animals and our barbarium. But I think today I, I feel very, very comfortable because it just, it reproduces itself again and again and again. And you can yeah. take different kinds of immune deficiencies in a mouse model, in mouse models, and you will always see it. Now, not every behavior will be affected. And you know, it's not like all or none. It's not, I'm not saying without T cells, brain doesn't work. No, it's not the case. But without T cell, the brain is not as efficient as it is when the immune system is there. Yeah, and I'm I'm a hundred percent in agreement with everything you said. We did some work. I had a, a postdoc from Israel, actually, uh, Eitan Oppen. Yes, Oppen, uh, he's yeah, a, I know him. He's a Barlan now, and yes. when he was in my lab, he did some studies in uh, mice that were deficient in certain immune receptors called toll-like receptors and found that they had some behavioral abnormalities. And then, of course, we found that the neurons themselves have the, the receptor for these toll-like receptors. So that's just another example yes. of, of, and, you know, we, we had the same thoughts exactly as yours that, okay, these, these receptors, the signaling systems are there all the time. Do they really just sitting there waiting for years and years for some infection or injury? No, they probably have some normal function. Yeah. For sure, yes. Yeah, and, and toll like you mentioned, toll -like those are extremely interesting because those actually, you know what they call toll like receptors because we have toll receptors in flies. Yeah. Right, so I mean, those are because are also affecting the. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna start doing some experiments in flies, is that? Yes, we actually we have a very very cool project in flies. We have a very very cool project with, that my postdoc is actually. I mean, the, he he is the fly guy. I just gave him freedom to do it, but he has a, a very very nice project where he finds a molecule which is produced by brain cells, which then regulates. So it's actually very cool. It's a molecule that is expressed by brain cells. It's, a, it's not an immune molecule, but that molecule regulates all these, uh, or many of the antimicrobial peptides. Uh -huh. And by regulating the antimicrobial peptides, it affects the microbiome or the 
uh, commensal bacteria in the fly's gut. Ah. And it particularly targets one particular strain of bacteria. And these bacteria produce a metabolite, ah. which is recognized by neurons, which are, which are controlling sleep in fly. Perfect. So and by controlling sleep, you control a lifespan. So it's from a molecule to, to, to commensal, to neurons, to, to yeah. sleep, to lifespan. It's really beautiful. I recently did a podcast with, with Sarkis Masmanian. Yes, yes, fantastic. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so that, that's perfect. And, uh, you know, he was doing kind of the same. Yeah, early. Sarkis is amazing. And he did both flies and, and mice. And so, yes, yeah. we absolutely uh, following his work. Okay. So why don't you talk about learning and memory and cognition? You yes. Can, and so, so again, so, you know, so we, uh, the very first study was done. Basically, we said, okay, we see all these all this defi immune deficiencies are, you know, having issues with, like I was telling you, uh, with stress response, with injury response. So is there effect on learning and memory? And, uh, and, then, and then we just, uh, we, we, if, whether you take a mouse that is born without functional T cells, T lymphocytes, huh. uh, then this mice is impaired on many, many different aspects of learning and memory, whether this is a social behavior or learning behavior, spatial behavior, fear memory, you name it. But then, you know, then we said, okay, well, we can't just, you know, forever describe these different behaviors which are affected by lack of immune cells. We must go deeper and understand what are the molecules, what molecules are driving it. And so the very first work, which was done quite nice mechanistically in my lab was done by Tony Filiano, who is now a professor at Duke. And so Tony is a phenomenal guy. So he actually came to my lab. I don't know why he joined my lab. It was really a blessing. It was about, for he joined about 10 years ago or so. Um, and he just said, okay, I'm very excited about autism, you know, uh, uh, neuroimmunology of autism. And I said, Tony, um, you know, uh, the uh, player is yours, you know, just do whatever you want. And so he started by doing this, basically showing that immune deficient mice have, you know, I don't, I don't like to call this uh, autism because it's not, but they, but they are showing a, a, a social uh, be behavioral, social behavioral deficits as you would see in mouse models of autism, whatever that means. But again, they have social deficits. And then we were, of course, we said, okay, you know, we can, we can transfer, and then, so we can fix this problem by giving this immune deficient mice back their T cells. So that's all, that's all great, that's all wonderful. But now how this is happening? And um, so then we collaborated with, with, actually with, my, with my classmate uh, back from Weizmann, who by then was professor at U UMass, you know, Vladimir Litvak. And so, he was a computational biologist. So we told him, listen, here is our problem. We have immune cells, T cells are doing something in the brain. We have no clue what the molecule is. Can you somehow model this? And he said, okay, let's go. So like, remember, this was like maybe 2000 and maybe 12, 13 when he was doing it. So way before single cell, well before all these you know, huge data sets available online, it was before that time. But we already had a bunch of uh, uh, bulk sequence data sets which were there. So what he did is he took about a thousand transcriptomes, which were available online, looking at how different cytokines induce, uh, so cytokines inducing uh, signaling, signaling responses to cytokines in a bunch of different cells, immune, non-immune, whatever. And then he was looking at the brain signatures, whatever was available online. Basically, you know, whether it's somebody, somebody would take a mouse, treat the mouse with antipsychotic, boom and then sequences them, we take that, that data, okay? Somebody makes a mouse, which is very asocial mouse, boom, we take that data. So we took all the data that was about thousand transcriptomes. And then we were saying, okay, let's see where this, where these brain signatures and immune signatures, where are they overlapping? And then, and then he was doing all this, you know, magical computational exercises, which of course I would never even be able to explain them intelligently. And it was pointing to a couple of different immune molecules that we would see those pathways seem to be changing in brains of mice, which were uh, socially affected or maybe were on psychostimulants, which we also kind of uh, consider them as you know, the social effects. And one of them was interferon gamma. And we said, okay, the others are too complicated, but interferon gamma is an easy molecule because we have the mice. It's an easy, it's an easy, easy knockout mouse. So we said, you know, let's just check. So we took interferon gamma deficient mice. And what we found is these mice were also socially deprived. And we said, okay, well, here we have something, it's real. Then we take interferon gamma receptor knockout mice and they were also socially deprived. And we said, okay, fantastic. 
It's a, it's a molecule and without molecule myself social deficit, without the receptor myself social deficit. This is very exciting. Let's now try to understand where is the signaling happening because it's a, the interferon gamma is also beautiful because it's really mostly produced by either NK cells or T cells. So it's a, two types of cells that make it. You know, some cytokines could be made by almost anything, right? It's like microglia can make it or, or, or astrocytes could make it. And then of course it becomes a lot more difficult. But these are more kind of more constrained uh, cytokines, interferon gamma. So we of course thought microglia will be our. That was exactly when Beth already published her papers, which were very uh, uh, substantial and kind of uh, made a lot of uh, brought a lot of interest into microglia. So we said, okay, you know, we have this great story: peripheral cytokines on microglia doing something for behavior, which is super cool. But the problem is, so what we did is we said, okay, let's remove receptor from microglia and let's remove also its signaling molecules from microglia. And there was absolutely no effect. Mm. So microglia expressed the receptors, but when you remove them in that particular system of social interaction, there was absolutely no, no difference. And we said, okay, well, what, so receptor deficient mice have social problems with social interactions, but it's not going through microglia. So what other cell could it be? No. So no, exactly. So no, back then there was no single cell. So what do you do? Hey, you just go to in situ hybridization, you know, with the one or two colors. Today we can do it with with Murfish with five hundred colors. Back then it was you know one or maybe two, if you have really talented technician. And so we actually had the amazing technician Wendy Baker was in our lab, and so she actually helped Tony to do this experiment. And what they found is that not only microglia, but also neurons were expressing this interferon gamma receptor. And we said, huh, this is interesting. Uh, and we can also do flow cytometry when we can, it's an immune technique uh, when you can uh, uh, label these receptors on immune cells and you can also, and on, on brain cells and you can also see them. So we said, okay, neurons now express interferon gamma receptor. That's, today, of course, you can go online to a bunch of different data sets, put your favorite cytokine receptor and it will show you exactly which neurons express it. Back then it wasn't the case. So then we said, okay, well, let's maybe remove the receptor from neurons and see what happens, which we did. And to make a long story short, if you remove the receptor from inhibitory neurons, then you recapitulate the effect of mm -hmm. lack of T cells or lack of cytokine, oh, which yeah. suggests that there is a signaling between your immune derived molecule and neurons a direct communication, which is extremely exciting because you don't have T cells sitting next to these neurons. So they're probably sitting in these areas in these borders of the brain releasing those molecules, which may be then diffusing through the brain. I mean, now, I'm now this is a lot of hand waving because this is all interpretation of the data, but it could be many other different interpretations. Well, but what we see right now is that interferon gamma is probably coming from the borders, but it affects directly neurons. That, it's interesting that, that uh, it's in the GABAergic interneurons. Yes. Right? Um, so for our listeners, the main excitatory neurons in the brain are glutamatergic, use glutamate, the inhibitory use GABA. And th this is just fascinating from the standpoint of autism because there's a lot of data from just from the fact that kids with autism have increased incidence of seizures, epileptic seizures, exactly. to EEG recordings, to studies of, of mouse models, genetic models, and there's hyper excitability of neural networks. Yes. So maybe the interferon gamma is kind of modulating the, the inter yes. inter neurons to exactly to constrain the activity within normal limits. And we showed that actually we're collaborating. We were collaborating with Mark Binacker, who is a physiologist. And so he showed that if you apply interferon gamma on slices, you potentially inhibit the recurrence. So basically. This data, this was, this was quite exciting for us because that was the first demonstration that I'm aware of, of a real modulation. So basically now cytokine is neuromodulator, right? It modulates neural activity. It doesn't act, it doesn't induce neural firing. It doesn't, it's not, it's not doing that, but it's modulates the activity of the neuron. And when you remove it, your activity of the circuit is changing and therefore your behavior is changing. Yeah. And actually it was fascinating because I think maybe that same year or maybe a year later, there was a paper from, uh, Gloria Choi from MIT and her spouse, uh, Jun Ha from Harvard, they published maternal, you probably know this work, maternal cytokine, IL-17, can diffuse through uh, from mother to babies and affect neurons in particular brain region directly again on neurons and then change behavior and make like autism-like behavior. Mm. 
So now we have another example of another cytokine affecting neurons. And then that same year came paper from the Bonos lab, which was, I think it's a most fascinating study because he showed that going back to your question about C. elegans, that in C. elegans, IL-17 homologue directly targets receptors on neurons and regulates mouse behavior in response to CO2. So now this, 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 this thing, you know, it's not just cytokines, are ex receptors are expressed, they functional and they're evolutionarily conserved. I mean, now it becomes a lot more interesting and evolution and, and, and mechanistically kind of kind of very interesting. So we just had paper last a couple of months ago, paper where we showed that in other molecules, interleukin-4, produced again by, by, by subset of, of, of T cells, can affect learning and memory in fear, fear conditioning. So fear, fear learn. And before then, we showed that the same IL-17 also affects, affects anxiety behavior through different sets of neurons. So, you know, it's a uh, kind of the, the, this, this mystery box is, you know, is being kind of, you know, it's like this, this uh, Russian doors when you can open one and there's another one inside it. I think we're now going to slowly uh, unraveling this, 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 this things. And you now maybe one day when we know exactly which circuits affect which behaviors, I mean, this is now a kind of science fiction. And we see all these neurons have been sequenced. Maybe algorithms can predict based on expression of different immune, immune, immune molecular receptors on those neurons, which immune cells can modulate, which immune molecules could modulate those targets and those circuits, right? Okay, stay you... tuned, stay tuned for that. <laughs> uh, this is a good point. So the interferon gamma findings are exciting from the standpoint of, I mean, the question that may be popping into people's heads is, well, if you give, say, a child with autism interferon gamma, is that going to have a benefit to them? So, you know, this, of course, hasn't been done. Uh, but I think that, um, I mean, I'll tell you something extremely sad, right? Well, unfortunately, most neurological disorders, we do not have uh, even therapy for, right? I mean, we can control, of course, seizures. We can control maybe positive, positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, but we really don't have any cure for sure. We don't even have a good therapy for really the source of the problem. Now, for if you're looking at multiple sclerosis, we have 20 plus approved, approved drugs, FDA approved drugs. And some of them control the disease really, really well. I mean, of course, without side effects, nothing works. Some, some have, of course, side effects. But overall, this is probably disease with the most amount of, 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 of therapies. Yeah. All of them are targeting the immune system. Yeah, yeah. So what I am thinking is maybe it's really extremely difficult to not only deliver drugs across the blood-brain barrier, which we haven't talked about, but of course there is a barrier that prevents a bunch of bunch of molecules, so most molecules to get through. So maybe you know, instead of targeting really neurons, maybe we should start thinking to your question about interferon gamma. Maybe we should start thinking about modulating the immune system as a as a, as a, as a, as a therapeutic target for neurological disorders. Because the example I always like to give is if you think of uh, Formula One, if you think of car racing, yeah. right? You could have the best car in the world and the best driver without the maintenance crew. That yeah. driver in that car will never win the race. Yeah. And your immune cells, by targeting the immune system, you are not making driver better and you are not making the car better. These are the, this is what you have. You have your body and you have your brain and you have your neurons. And those are the functional units. These are the neurons are your driver, they drive. But without the maintenance crew, these neurons will not be able to function at their best. And the maintenance crew, you could, it's much easier to replace and to improve and to change and to train. And I mean, that's, I think, maybe if that's will be, that will be our focus, we may be able, you know, I'm always saying, I don't want to cure Alzheimer's, but I would love to postpone the onset to an age of maybe 150, 160, when it's comfortably <laughs> will be, you know, beyond our lifespan. Until, unless, of course, Tony Wyscori will extend our lifespans too. 200 and, but before then and there there are mouse models that uh where the mice accumulate amyloid in their brain and have kind of degenerative changes in their own learning and memory deficits and you've done some work in them manipulating the immune system right yes so well so um 
with Alzheimer's mice, the immune system is mostly Michal Schwartz's work. She's uh -huh. kind of focusing on, on, on boosting immune cells and getting some very, very interesting and exciting results. We are mostly looking at Alzheimer's as a plumbing problem. Mm. Okay, so you have a so if your sink is clogged, you can play with the faucet, but the problem is not in the faucet. The problem is not with production. I mean, production may also be, of course, a problem, but in this case, you also have a clogged sink, and you need to go and unclog your your sink. You need to go for you need to go for a plumbing a problem. And what we think is happening is Alzheimer's, in addition to, I don't want to simplify the disease to one system, it's a super complex disease. But I think among many other factors, you also have a problem with the plumbing system, a plumbing system being the lymphatic system. And so what we're suggesting is that you could bring your very best therapy. And these drugs, funny enough, all these antibodies, they are working quite well in mice. And the problem is with the translation into humans. Now, one of the aspects, so what is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? Age. Age, right? Yeah. So if you're old enough, you will develop Alzheimer's. What is the number one factor we're trying to avoid uh, modeling in mouse models? Age, because nobody has the uh, luxury to wait until mice will develop something spontaneously, or even in the slower models of AVP Swedish, for example, where it takes, I don't know what, uh, 18 months until mouse exhibits this, the deficit. We all, most of us working with models which are fast progressing disease. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Mark, you disappeared. Do, I, do, do, do you hear oh, me still? Did I disappear? Yes, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. And yes. you, you still you still have another half hour, do you? Yeah, no, I have time. Yeah, I don't know why my okay. phone rang. So I knew some phone rang. Okay, so that's good because, all right. So age is the major risk factor, and with your analogy with no, and in mice with, yes. with, with your analogy with the house and plumbing, I was just thinking we've been in this house twenty years, and one of the things that seems to have the problems with first is the plumbing exactly <laughs> exactly yes and mice do also show problems with plumbing but they it comes later so now you take your anti-amyloid and, and no i'm not i'm not saying that antibodies are working or not working i'm not i'm not an md right so i'm a phd all i can dis discuss is the mouse data and what i'm saying is that if you take the fact if you take a young mouse with a lot of flux and you put this antibody it clears those plaques really, really nicely. We have done it many times, but of course before us, many, many, many other labs have done it. So this is working. Now you take the same antibody, you put it into humans, plaques are also being cleared, right? I mean, we know that people are dying and plaques are cleared, but there are many other problems which are happening as a result of it. And there is no substantial benefit on cognitive, on cognitive uh, function. So we ask ourselves, okay, you take your very best drug, and you put it in a system which is clogged. Right. So you take your anti-amyloid antibodies, you put it in a system which is not functioning, it dissolves the plaques, and now you form those soluble uh, oligomers, which are arguably even more toxic than, yeah, the, than, right. than, the, than the aggregates, right? Yes. And the brain is swamped because, the, again, the drainage, the sink of the brain, the lymphatics are clogged. And then what? Then you now dissolve those plaques and you create it even more toxic molecules, which are now damaging the brain and are kind of you know, staying there for a long time. So actually, if we take a mouse and we kill those ablate, we have different methods to, uh, to uh, interfere with the function of lymphatics. And then we inject the same anti-amyloid antibodies. Yes, they clear plaques, maybe not as efficient, but they do. But then they create a bunch of problems. They, they interfere with the vasculature of the brain they hugely activate microglia, this immune, immune cells of the brain, and they create all kinds of problems which are now we seeing in the young mouse with this functional lymphatics. So we said, okay, probably same thing happening also in humans because in aging lymphatic system is like you're saying, a plumbing is really being affected, right? So it's not functioning as well. And so we, we said, okay, could then we take an old mouse uh, with the problem with the ongoing this um, amyloidosis, and so we took a really slow model, which is a, which is a mouse that is about 18, 20 months of age, which is probably equals to maybe 70, 80 year old patient uh, human. And now we said, okay, let's give them antibody alone. They hardly work. Um, 
but let's now give them antibody, but also enhance their function of their lymphatic system. Will we get synergistic effect? And so we are getting a wonderful synergistic effect. We're getting better active, a better phenotype of microglia, healthier uh, blood brain barrier. And overall, a mouse even 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 performs better on cognitive tasks. No, no, so it, this is an example of you know of synergistic effect of two systems, right? Now I, I don't think you're giving the mice Drano, right? You're how are you enhancing that the lymphatic the clinic? So I will exactly yeah. So what we what you know this is through works of, of 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 many people in the field of lymphatic biology. We know that if you give uh, so there is a growth factor called VGFC. It's a it's a molecule which binds to VGFR3. And VGFR3 is a receptor, we have three and four. And these receptors are primarily expressed on lymphatic endothelial cells. They are also expressed on endothelial cells, but the numbers are much lower. Really the major expression is on lymphatic endothelial cells. So we know through work of Kari Alitalo primarily, but also other people that if you remove VGFR3, this receptor from developing mouse, lymphatics will not be formed. So this mouse will be lethal, okay. What we did not, what we found out serendipitously, and then Kari Alitalo showed it a little better, that the meningeal lymphatics, which are at the borders of our brains, for some reason, which we don't understand fully, are not only dependent on VGFC or this molecule for their development, like all other lymphatics, but they also depend on this molecule for their maintenance. So normally, if you remove this molecule from adult mouse, it doesn't affect lymphatic beds in other tissues or at least it doesn't affect them very badly, very acutely, but it does affect this system oh. around the brain very badly and very acutely. Basically the system collapses and almost completely disappears. And what we know is with aging, VGFC goes down. So what we're doing is in old mice, we're treating them with VGFC with soluble molecule. Oh. We're applying it as a, as, a, as a brain shampoo um, or really, or, or we can inject a virus which will express the molecule. And this actually very nicely enhances the, the diameter of lymphatics, the basically rejuvenation of lymphatic system. So yes, so we can use, I think it's called, called Rhino, whatever it's called, whatever, whatever, it's called, whatever this thing is called that unclogs the, 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 the uh, pipes, you can use VGFC for that system. And actually it works quite nicely. It expands lymphatics and they seem to work quite well. So does, does this vascular endothelial cell growth factor also stimulate growth of the blood vessels or not? No, no, so again, this is, so there's a, there's a I think it's a family of uh, four, well, four receptors. I don't know how many ligands are there, but so this is VGFR3, receptor oh. number three, oh. and, the, and the ligand is called VGFC. It's not 100%, nothing in biology is 100% specific, but this is a much, much, much more I specific see. for lymphatic. So if you remove it, nothing happens to blood vasculature, but lymphatic vessels disappear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's closely related to the protein. lymphatic endothelial. Yeah. The endothelial lymphatic endothelial cells are born, at least majority of them, from blood from venous blood endothelial cells, right? So they are related, but the receptor is slightly different. So here is V uh, um, VGFR uh, two, and here is VGFR three. All right. So next, uh, talk about protective autoimmunity, you, you kind of did a little bit, but from the standpoint of potential down the road, new therapeutic approaches to neurological disorders. Yeah, no, no, this is, again, this is very exciting, right? So basically we have endogenous, endogenous cells, which under some circumstances could uh, get activated and then destroy the tissues, going back to our army analogy, that when you know, your army actually destroys your own, your own cities, when things go crazy and somebody go, go, goes nuts. Um, but the question is, okay, in normal, normal physiology, they are protective, right? They are helping us to deal with problems. How do we augment that thing? So how do we take now this healing, uh, the healing mechanisms within us and enhance them? But we need to be very careful because you need to enhance them to the point where it's not becoming destructive. Everything in biology, I think, is a bell shape, right? Yeah. Everything is a bell shape. Yeah. And so how do you, so I think physiologically, you are at the very beginning of bell shape, and then pathologically, you are at the very end of bell shape. And so how do you bring it to that area where you get maximum benefit with minimum, minimum deficits? And this is not an easy question. So, you know, we are now trying, for example, to come up with some sort of therapies that will be, you know, maybe 
Well, I think one of the major goals is to understand really the, the, the function of these cells and which cell does what, and then try to augment some of the cells without targeting the other cells or with maybe suppressing the other cells. So we, for example, recently showed, um, I don't know if you follow that work, that the skull has a bone marrow. Yeah. And the skull bone marrow derived cells, well, we didn't show that. We just showed that skull bone marrow derived cells are constantly populating our borders of the brain. And also after injury, for example, these cells are coming into the injured brain or injured spine. Now the question is, and so what we see is we see that bunch of cells coming from local sources, from skull or vertebra bone marrow, and other cells are coming from the periphery. So the question is now, are these the same kind of cells? It just number numbers matter, right? So you don't have enough from local sources, so you bring cells from outside. Or are these different types of cells? Or are these, you know, these are, for example, maybe maybe state troops versus, you know, uh, 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 real army troops, right? So they come in, they they do a little bit, they 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 they, they take, they treat the problem in a very different. Like it's a local police versus FBI, right? It's a different approach to the same problem. And so if that's the case, and we can understand which cell does what, maybe we can suppress cells from periphery so they don't come and then bring more cells from local sources. Or maybe in some other conditions, maybe like in brain tumors, where you actually want more of more aggressive immune cells, you want less of local cells and more of these peripheral cells. So this is, this is, you know, this is extremely, I mean, right now we are super in, in, in the infancy of this of these studies, because I think the problem will be if we ever, I think we need to, in my, that's my opinion, right? We can't rush into clinical trials. I think you need to understand the system extremely well because if you rush into clinical trial, you may kill this immune approach for neurological disorders forever. Yeah. And I think that's very, very dangerous. I mean, somebody of course will do it at some point soon. And, and um, I just hope that it will, done, it will be done well because I think getting no benefit is one thing, but getting, destruction by their approach it's a whole different thing and could set back the whole the whole yeah. the whole approach for many many years so i think mm -hmm. we need to be very very careful and we don't you know it's 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 a to some extent it's a shame on to the other on the other hand sometimes you know, i look back and i say okay over the last 20 years we made in, in our field in neuroimmunology we made this huge progress right huge progress but on the other hand we still there's so much unknown yeah we still so many things we don't understand. And I'm always looking at cancer immunotherapy and I say, no, these guys are just there. I don't know if they're better, but they definitely, the depth of knowledge there is so much deeper. I, I think that and it's, 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 it's easier. I mean, it, all, it always um, fascinated me, you know, it seems like it, it's easier, should be easier to kill cells than to- uh, uh, Protect them. Protect them. Yeah, and, I, I would um, agree. Now, ex experimentally, you said that there's bone marrow in the skull, in the, the skull, just as there's bone mm -hmm. marrow in, in the bones of your arms and legs. And like someone with leukemia, you know, a blood cancer, typically, don't they like give them radiation? It depends on the cancer, I guess, but like radiation, uh, these blood cells are coming from stem cells in the bone marrow and right. those cells divide rapidly and cells right. that divide rapidly are more vulnerable to gamma radiation uh, being killed so for example the side effects of radiation therapy are typically gi problems where you've got a lot of turnover of the gastro the cells lining your gut and so on now in the brain there are some stem cells and they're vulnerable to radiation, but they're only in one small brain region. Now, experimentally, don't you use radiation, gamma radiation to like deplete the bone marrow cells? And I guess you could expose just the head to radiation or yes. just the body? Yeah so, yeah, so we can do just the head, just the body uh, or, or, or both. And, you know, we actually now, so we are doing this kind of work because we want to replace one part of the, of the, of the, so let's say replace body with one type of cells and brain with another type of cells. But we are now going, doing less and less radiation because there are, today there are very efficient drugs which you introduce systemically and they go into bone marrow and oh. kill those progenitor cells. Oh. And then you can inject. Uh, so, 
And then, of course, the problem is that you cannot really ablate just the body or just the brain. So with radiation, this is very cool because you just put a lead cover on the head and then the head is not being targeted. Right? So it's very cool. But we're trying to develop different methods uh, to maybe locally introduce uh, progenitors. Um, and uh, so we can deplete the whole body and then introduce locally yeah. different types of cells in different, in different bone marrow niches. And just again, just to see again, which cells, is it really, does it really matter whether when you have injury, your cell is coming from a tibia or whether it's coming from a vertebra uh, a T7? Does it really matter? Or it doesn't, and if it does, then then we then then you know then we can we can we can start focusing on how we bring more of local cells, how we augment these cells trafficking, and how we suppress the other ones from coming. And I do believe that these local cells. We just had a paper a couple of weeks ago. We published a paper showing that cerebrospinal fluid, which actually washes the brain and goes through the whole brain and kind of comes out, as I described initially, that cerebrospinal fluid can also reach bone marrow initials and spinal cord and in the skull. So it delivers signals from the brain to these bone marrow niches and base, maybe even kind of know, pre, not predisposed, but prepares or, or, or educates these cells of what's happening in the brain and maybe how to live, how to deal with the brain, right? So they're being brainwashed, literally. <laughs> these cells being brainwashed from the very beginning. And, um, and it, it, that tells me that they probably, when they come down, they are probably a little bit different in their phenotype and then cells which are coming from periphery and are not brainwashed, right? So they just come and they, of course, perform a very, very different, different type of work. Again, we need to show that. We need to understand. I think that for injuries, you would want local cells more because they will handle things more elegantly and more carefully. And for brain tumors, you may want the peripheral cells more because they will take care more aggressively and will really remove the tumor. But again, this is just my hypothesis, which will probably be proven wrong. But so far, that's what we have. <laughs> Well, I guess we covered a lot of ground in this. Would you like to say any, and I'm gonna put some links in, in the description on the, on the YouTube channel to uh, a few of your review articles like annual review of immunology one, and I, you had a science and one in science. Uh, we had nature, we have, an, we have a very cool one recently about cytokines and neurons in nature reviews and immunology. I think this one probably people will like it. It's a, it's, it's, it's a good one. That just came out? It was maybe last year, okay. nature reviews immunology. Yeah. I think I've probably seen it. <laughs> yeah, probably. And uh, what, what's your future vision? You're, you're fairly young yet, right? Um, yes, very young. <laughs> So you have some uh, long-term visions for your research? Uh, yes. You know, uh, 10 years ago, I would not ever dare to say that I want to, you know, through my research to be able to cure neurological disorders. Uh, I won't say it today as well, but I do, like I said before, you know, we may not be able to cure Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or many other diseases. But I really think that we may be able to delay the onset of these diseases by enhancing this maintenance ah. crew, by providing better, better, better maintenance to the brain. We may be able to delay the onset. We may be able to um, attenuate the actual disease severity and maybe you know, improve overall quality. I think, it's, I think it's all about, so my dream is not just, just to live long, but it's all about healthy aging. Yeah. Right? How do you live a long and healthy life? And they and then die at 120 suddenly out uh, from I don't know what something else a car crash or whatever. Well, this this brings up something that I've had a lot of interest in. You know the, the beneficial effects of exercise and intermittent fasting on the brain, and we know that that people, for example, with COVID who don't exercise and are overweight are more prone to bad outcomes. So they're more prone to having. Uh, more inflammation, the bad kind of inflammation in exactly, the lungs, yeah. where you got these nasty macrophages. Um, but there's also evidence that exercise, for sure, and a little bit with uh, intermittent fasting, can improve the uh, some of these immune mechanisms you've been talking about. For example, exercise enhancing natural killer activity. Right. What, and, and this gets to the prevention end of it again, a risk reduction. So there may be some things people can do right now to 
improve their immune function. Do you have any comments beyond what I've said? On well, no, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an MD, right? Yeah. I'm not even a, a nutrition, nutritionist or whatever. So I can't really give advice to people, but, yeah. but I do think that, um, uh, I mean, it would, wouldn't be nice to have vaccine against uh, Parkinson's or against yeah. Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. You train yeah. your immune system and uh, you make it mm, ready to fight when there is a problem there in the brain. Because remember, right, like, uh, like so what was so unique about COVID? It was just a new virus, which immune, our immune system has never seen before. Right. That was the actual problem with the virus. Uh, because once you, once you train your immune system, it takes care of the virus very, very well, right? So... If, if there is an allergy, if, if the immune, and, I, and I don't have the answer, but if immune system takes care of neurological, and the same thing we're doing with, with, with cancers, right? We enhancing the immune system and we're training the immune system against cancers. So can we train immune system? Can we have vaccine for Alzheimer's disease, vaccines for Parkinson, vaccine for schizophrenia? I, you know, I don't want to say that we will have a vaccine, but I do believe that we will probably have some sort of immune modulatory uh, therapies that will affect at least a, a, a subset of, of brain disorders. Uh, okay. And that's what, you know, that's where I, maybe when, if, if we contribute like, you know, one gram to that thing through our research, then maybe I will be able to happily retire or whatever, I don't know, switch careers. All right, great, Johnny. I've been, this is a delight. It was nice to meet you for the first time. I've over the years, seen a little bit of your work. Um, no, no, we've met in Virginia. You came as our speaker, so we've met. We met in, oh, yeah. in Virginia. You were you our. Know, I, one of my big problems in life in general is, I have trouble remembering. You know, so I'll, I'll meet somebody like you, and talk about the research, and then I'll remember all the details about the research, but. I may forget that I actually talked to you or where. I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Several places. Yeah, that's right. You were in Virginia a long time, and I gave it. That wasn't too long ago. No, no, you, you, were our, you were our student retreat speaker, I think maybe three or four years ago. Yeah, yeah. Maybe four yeah. years ago. And you've only been in St. Louis a few years now. Yeah, two years, yeah. Yeah. Under great. Years. Well, it's a great place to be. Yes, yes, for sure, yes. All right. Great to talk Mark, to you. Mark, thank you so much. It's fantastic. Thanks a lot. All right. Good talking bye. to you. Bye-bye.